So hello, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Paul Farrelly. I'm the Chief Digital Officer here at the Digital Space. We're a strategic partner with Alternet, specialising working with them across their, uh, their whole portfolio, but uh, very much with a focus on the whole SD-WAN and secure access edge technology. And it's very nice to see you today. And hello everyone, uh, my name is Chris Roberts, uh, as it says on the screen, I'm a security operations business development manager, so my focus area is on the whole the advanced threat, um, visibility and automation pieces that we can speak to as, as part of, as Paul said, our sort of wide portfolio of capabilities um, and looking forward to, to talking to you about some of the aspects that very much link into uh, the, uh, the switch off uh, as we go through today's webinar. Thanks, Chris. Yes, and then when Chris has run through uh, the security side, I'll just give you a, a quick, very quick, and we can always follow up later if, if you guys uh, are really interested in just what's happening in 5G. And also that dovetails really nicely into what's happening with what is nicknamed the PSTN switch off, but is in fact eight big switch offs that's going to happen over the next 10 years. The PSTN is going to be switched off, the SDH, the PDH, and eventually five and a half thousand exchanges will be decommissioned. So I'll run into a little bit more detail with that and you'll see how that all integrates into all of the front end uh, opportunities we see in security. Fantastic. Okay, so let's just pivot to, as, as Paul said, security first. So uh, I think setting the context um, as to why you know, what is the impact if we don't deal uh, with security now as we're preparing for addressing the whole speeds and feeds angle linked to the switch off? Um, and, you know, what I've tried to summarize uh, is, is on this slide very much what we feel the impact could be. Um, a lot of it comes down to patient zero, and that is the uh, the individual uh, device uh, and, and user that gets an unknown threat that's never been seen before that therefore could be ransomware could be a remote access trojan we've been seeing a lot of that recently linked to uh, holiday social engineering um, but it's all about understanding the unknown um, and as I said there's a lot of social engineering at the moment the most recent sort of um, spurt of social engineering angles has been around targeting people that are desperate to travel having come out of the pandemic so we're seeing uh, the likes of um, travel itineraries uh, being sent to potential victims uh, in sort of spam and also in, in sort of spear phishing approaches and encouraging people to open these and you know very clever ways underneath that in order to hide the likes of a remote access trojan so that the hackers get control of those devices. So, you know, it's, it's, it's always the case. Social engineering is always going to be uh, the easiest way to get into to systems by subverting ultimately the most fallible part of the computer, which is the human operating it. Um, lateral spread across workloads, again, linked into the switch off. We're going to see higher speeds. You know, we're, um, many of you, I'm sure now, are listening and watching this webinar connected to uh, gigabit uh, fiber to the premises type connections and of course lateral spread when you've got such high speeds puts your workloads at greater risk of of both damage of uh, of theft of uh, you know inappropriate encryption ransomware etc of course all that leads to operational impact and we've all seen uh, over the recent six months uh, and even more recently than that the impact that the likes of, for example, the Ukraine war is having, uh, for example, we've seen uh, six particular versions of ransomware that effectively are destructive, not actually ransomware, even though they ask for a ransom, you never get your data back. We've seen six of those types of attacks in the first five months of this year, which is a 600% increase on the same period of last year. That's driven by the Ukrainian war, but just because they're released to target that particular geography, of course, the internet is global. So as we saw with WannaCry many years ago, uh, that it, get, it gets everywhere. So clearly the operational impact is, is huge. And linked to that, I think, again, we, we're all very well aware of the risk of reputational damage, the risk of data being lost or subverted or changed, uh, therefore the impact on the likes of GDPR legislation. And that clearly has a potential impact on 
the the, the retention of, of customers, the perception of customers towards your brand, way beyond, you know, are they willing to wait five seconds for a website to refresh, which of course is part of the switch off as well, again, down to that speeds and feeds that Paul's going to talk about. Um, and one thing I think that's very much worth talking about is, is the persistent infection piece, because lots of organizations may feel that they well, may they may see that they're being uh, subjected to a ransomware infection but there is an increasing angle where attackers are using that as a way to um, divert attention um, to typical trojan horse uh, theory where that it allows them to get a foothold elsewhere in the network that is un that goes unnoticed for potentially years. So the persistent infection is part of the overall impact that we're looking to address here. And the final one, again, worth talking about, technical debt. So many industries, um, and specifically from a retail perspective, and we'll talk about retail challenges very shortly, um, there's a lot of technical debt, whether it's, you know, old you know, EPOS-based systems that are absolutely fully functional, delivering value to the business, maybe not capitally depreciated yet, but from a technical debt perspective, maybe they're not fully supported from a security uh, perspective in terms of what can or cannot be installed upon them. So lots of potential for impact here, but if we can go to the next slide, please. Why is that not moving? <laughs> there we go. Fantastic. So a little bit of context. Thank you very much, Paul. A little bit of context. Um, I talked about the, the ransomware infections. If you look at 2021 to 2020, um, we saw within Fortinet, within our FortiGuard Labs uh, security intelligence division, we saw evidence of over 10 times increase in ransomware infections. That is continuing to increase. And I have no doubt that as we publish this year's figures, we'll see a further increase with the similar sort of magnitude, probably greater numbers. We, we've seen um, OT networks and I, I, IoT networks uh, continue to converge with the classic IT network, which ultimately simply results in, in different types of risks, potentially greater risks to stability and security. Um, we've all seen the likes of the colonial pipeline attack, i.e. the supply chain risk. And I think from a retail perspective, again, I've got some points specifically linked to that later on. I think that's maybe one of the most important aspects to protect against. Um, and again, as speeds and feeds are getting greater, the risk profile changes. Um, we're seeing hackers, um, you know, bring fully functional business units to play and actually offering full ransomware as a service and malware as a service and remote access Trojan as a service offerings to the wider communities. And these are very, very good pieces of software there. You, you can actually assemble all the different components that you want, create the piece of malware that you want, and then sell it to someone else or deploy it yourself. So this is just like we're all used to using Office 365. They, the attackers are absolutely used to using as a service based attacks. We've seen insurance cover change. Uh, one of the large insurers fairly recently removed ransomware payments from their coverage for their cyber insurance. We then saw that particular insurer attacked by a number of attack by a number of um, um, attacker groups. And I think again, that's causing you know, organizations to reevaluate how they how they perceive risk, how they address risk, can they offset risk with insurance, or do they need to bring in the whole process, people and technology piece to address it? And clearly we're in a very uh, interesting time in terms of geopolitical instability, whether you look at the inflation figures from a financial perspective. But if we pivot over to the right, I just wanted to talk about maybe four context setting examples of some of the most recent threats we've seen. Um, the first one is enemy bot. I'll cover this briefly. Um, ultimately, it's a very, very clever piece of malware that is constantly evolving through a number of attack groups. Uh, they are, it's on GitHub, they can download it, they can bring other pieces of code into it, recompile it, redistribute it. It's very, very clever. It uses the dark web for communication, so it tries to more, more actively hide its activity when it's talking to its command and control servers. It also attacks a variety of devices, whether that be a, a number of different router types, whether it be a number of different IoT devices, and also a, a, a number of uh, Intel-based, uh, Intel processor-based devices as well. What it does is it actually then reaches out to the dark web 
brings the correct piece of software to finish the installation to keep that malware active on that device and then communicates via the dark web to maintain communication with the command server. So we're seeing the runs, we're seeing the malware get more and more intelligent. We're seeing the attack groups expand the capabilities of individual malware programs to do more damage, more widely, more quickly, um, and much more cleverly. Lightning Steel is worth talking about as well, because I think a number of you listening to this will have picked browsers based upon perceptions of privacy, based upon perceptions of security, whether it's Chrome, whether it's the Brave browser, whether it's uh, Firefox, uh, Safari. The point being that we saw a piece of malware that attacked 30 different browser types, Firefox and Chromium-based browsers, uh, which addresses pretty much all the ones I talked about. And what it did when it successfully installed itself was it, st it stole bookmarks, as you can see there, bookmarks, history, cookies, crypto wallets, it stole so much information that the reason I'm sort of pointing this out is that it's it's you know it's one to have a perception of privacy and security, but I think that's maybe a slight uh, putting your head in the sun type approach, and that it shouldn't remove the overall approach to pe you know people, process, and technology in terms of lowering risk and understanding risk. Two pieces of ransomware we've recently saw. Um, are worth talking about as well, again, to set the context. One piece of ransomware, even though it asked for a ransom, it just deleted all files greater than two megabytes. So you never got your data back, even if you paid the ransom. And the other piece of ransom, which actually was the one I found most interesting, was the Nakayawa ransomware. The reason I found this the most interesting is, yes, it encouraged, or it didn't encourage, it told victims to communicate of using the dark web with the attack group rather than normal internet communication or, or um, messaging, but it created a unique encryption key for every single uh, installation, every single successful infection. So therefore reverse engineering it and creating a generic vanilla disinfection routine, pretty much impossible. So again, it's just an example that the attacks are getting more and more clever and tied with, as Paul's going to talk about, the switch off where speeds and feeds are going to get quicker and quicker with lower and lower latency, it's very, very important to address the two together. So if we can go to the next slide, please, Paul. Now, it would be uh, you know inappropriate if we can just build that out. I think there's two clicks to build it out. Apologies, I should have removed the build. Um, we, we've talked oh, about this. A oh, bit too far. Go back. Okay. Oh, no worries. I think, you know, we won't talk about the figures because, of course, for every figure you see, there's a different angle. It's potentially very subjective. I would argue most figures can't be objective because the statistics that feed them uh, change on a daily basis. They're very dynamic. But I think, you know, we're seeing in general increasing levels, ever increasing levels of ransomware anxiety. And as I said, because a lot of it now is actually becoming destructive rather than allowing you to recover your data. And we're seeing those changes with, with the insurance. It's just ever more difficult, but it's driving massive anxiety. It can be addressed though. If we can move to the next slide, please. And I think in terms of a fairly recent ransomware survey, the attack vectors haven't really changed drastically. You know, we're still seeing a lot of stuff coming in via email. That's the primary um, sort of entry point for attackers. But we know we're seeing, as we saw with, with WannaCry, uh, vulnerable ports and vulnerable operating systems being used. Um, patching is, again, always on there. And social engineering is always on there as well. So the attack vectors aren't changing. But of course, they, they, they're still very, very successful. So why would they? If we can just move to the next slide, please. So let's talk about retail challenges. Now, now, just to put it into context, I think this is this is our perception of the retail challenges, and we'd be very interested, you know, if we've got this right, if we've got this wrong, because one of one of the, you know, it's very important for the combination of digital space and and Fortinet to to be able to help this audience particularly. It's very important that we understand your business and that we can speak to the potential benefits that we could offer to that in terms of what is important to yourself. So it strikes me that. On the security side, the dynamics that are, that are at play within the retail environment, you know, we've obviously got GDPR, we've got the whole PII piece, there's a huge amount of transactional data, um, there's all of the customer loyalty schemes, there's all the back-end databases, there's all of that stuff ultimately that, that is incredibly important to protect. Um, EPOS stability, uh, again, we've, we've seen 
not uh, I can't remember an example in the UK recently but I think in Italy there was uh, a recent example of a uh, pretty much a, a nationwide EPOS shutdown in terms of payment capabilities it wasn't the EPOS systems themselves it was the back-end payment provider that had issues but the point being that um, that impacted organ that impacted shops abilities to clearly process transactions so stability of not just the the EPOS system but the whole sort of supply chain through to transacting that that payment is obviously critical especially as cash becomes less and less favorable driven by the pandemic driven by technology driven by people's behaviors and and, and you know and what they find is easier or not especially with phones now being able to pay i certainly take very very rarely take my wallet out nowadays um IOT, I think, again, looking at the likes of things like product placement in, in retail stores, looking at design of, um, of, of websites, you know, there's more and more opportunity for IOT to play a part, whether it's tracking, you know, facial movements, whether it's tracking people's movements within stores and everything in between. Um, there's lots of opportunity there. And of course, that's brilliant in terms of the telematics you get out of it to then drive more traffic, drive more revenue, drive more repeatable business. But also, also of course, it, it drives very much additional security risks it drives overall risk to the business if it's not managed as part of the project to implement it successfully um, supply chains many many options to talk about there but again just sort of reinforcing the fact that from a retail environment i'd say supply chain is one of the most critical components because clearly if products can't be provided to your customers it's sort of dead in the water um, Web presence, uh, social engineering, we've talked about those already, so I'll, I'll move on swiftly from those. On the right hand side, I was sort of thinking as to, from an operational perspective, um, what could provide retail challenges that, again, would very much play a part in, in, in the topics we're talking about today. Um, and well, as you can see, there's a lot there. Won't go through all of them, but hopefully they resonate. Um, you know, whether it's getting the right marketing message, whether it's keeping customers on on point, regardless of where they are in the world and how they're interacting with your brand, whether it's understanding uh, the whole taxation piece uh, based upon location of, of of customer and the whole globalization that sort of plays to that. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think there's so many challenges from an operational perspective in retail that maybe the point I'm trying to make here is that it's very important that delivering a secure solution is done in as simple a way as possible, in as a repeatable a way as possible, so that ultimately you can then get on with the, the, the actual purpose of your business uh, in that retail environment that you exist within. If we can go to the next slide, please. So I think just to sort of summarize really, you know, what we're seeing across all verticals, just to clarify, is these four sort of primary uh, pain points that customers are talking to us about. And I think we've really covered them. You know, it's, it's around visibility because what you can't see, you can't manage, you can't understand the risk of. Um, Insider threats, you know, understanding behavioral aspects, understanding what's good behavior, what's bad behavior, and reporting and, and adapting and automating the responses to that. Um, uh, you know, understanding that the threat landscape is, as the surrounding infrastructure becomes ever more complex to drive better telemetry, to drive better visibility on, on behavior of customers and, and help you, you know, drive revenues, drive shareholder return and everything. I think that's very, very important. And the remote worker is obviously a key part of that, the whole working from anywhere. You know, we're talking more and more about that now. And, and again, there's absolutely ways to address the risks that that particular ethos provides. And then compliance, you know, uh, it's although it's not particularly, just as one example, although it's not particularly aligned to retail now, I think if any retail establishments have relationships with um, third party financing houses um, in terms of allowing customers to spread payments, for example, then the likes of the Digital Operational Resilience Act that sort of come into play, it could have a significant impact. Um, you know, it's, it's sort of, in my mind, it feels like the next SOX, it feels like uh, the next uh, GDPR. It's a very, very complex piece of legislation from memory. I think it's about 170 pages. It was a riveting read, as you can imagine. Um, but that is driving you know that that's causing pain how do you become how do you measure it how do you become compliant how do you achieve sustainable compliance how do you understand your risk profile aligned to achieving that compliance so these are the pain points that certainly we're seeing in our customers if we can go to the next slide please so 
threat intelligence, let's briefly talk about that because it's all very well having good security solutions, but without the right security intelligence uh, at the right place in the right time with the right context, then it's useless. Um, so, you know, if, if you've got Windows XP uh, based EPOS systems, you need to protect those. If you don't have Linux based EPOS systems, you don't need to protect those. So it's about optimizing the, uh, the way that your technology is used so that you maximize the value, you minimize the, the CapEx investment and the OpEx investment to achieve the protection that you need with the context that you have to have in order to deliver the posture that you need to achieve to make sure that your operations are sustainable. Um, and as you can see, you know, it covers everything from malware protection, you know, to what's actually being accessed, whether you've got a web presence and you're protecting the web presence, you're protecting the, the digital experience that your users have when they're interacting with your brand. Uh, it's understanding if you've been breached, how, when, where, and then immediately and automatically remediating that, recovering it, protecting your operational stability and to go back to that IOT security again it's very much talking to that understanding the risk and driving capability to to ensure that the posture adapts to that as well if we can go to the next slide please so just to put one figure I'm not going to go through the slide don't be too scared um, but every quarter 40 guard labs as I said, the, the security intelligence division of Fortinet, we publish um, a set of figures, clearly, as this slide speaks to. Um, the one I wanted to call out particularly was the 1006 zero day threats discovered. Now that is, that's constantly going up. To put it into context, in Q4 2021, it was 997. Not a massive increase, still an increase. Um, now, what that means is we've discovered 1,006 threats, pieces of malware, remote access trojans, ransomware, et cetera, that were never known about before. And if you can discover a zero day threat in an environment that isn't within your operational circumstances, then you've just protected your business from something like the next one cry and you've protected your operational stability. So again, it goes back to reinforce the importance of uh, the the value of and the value rather of security intelligence. We can go to the next slide, please. So very very briefly, br briefly rather, um, let's just talk about the Lockheed Martin kill chain because a lot of it comes down to breaking this, and this is the behaviour of attackers seeking to achieve their objectives, whether that's to steal intellectual property, whether that's to Cut, you know, destroy files, ransom files, install a remote access Trojan to get a persistent connection, etc. And it goes through right from the very left, finding out what's available, finding out what could be attacked, understanding from that knowledge what is vulnerable, then delivering an exploit to address that vulnerability, successfully exploiting that vulnerability, installing something that you want to install, like I said, maybe it's a remote access Trojan, linking to some form of command server and then achieving your objectives. It's a fair, it's a very simple sort of flow if you like, but breaking it is not simple. But the reason I think this is particularly important is it is possible to break the kill chain. It is possible to break attackers behavior at any and all points throughout this across cloud, across network and at the endpoint. Go to the next slide, please. And in fact, I'm conscious of time, so because uh, I think I might be slightly over Paul, please don't be angry. Um, so let's go to the next slide from this one as well, actually. So um, let's just go back to that patient zero piece. Um, very briefly, one of the things we're seeing more and more used is forensic detonation, sandboxing. And the reason we're seeing it more and more used is because you have more and more organizations, whether it's retail, whether it's governmental, um, whether it, et cetera, et cetera. We're seeing so many organizations request the, 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 um, the public to send information in. Let's say it's the police requesting, uh, gov uh, requesting the, the public to send information in that might help with an investigation. Maybe it's a, a car dealership that's selling cars and they want a leasing agreement signed. So they ask the customer to send a screen grab or a, a screenshot or a photograph or a scan. All of that is an unsustainable risk because you, the organization that is accepting those files doesn't know if those files are safe because they may have been tampered with. You don't know if the users, the customers have paid for full antivirus, how, you know, how up to speed they are on, on the risks that they're you know, potentially exposed to on a daily basis. So 
sandboxing can absolutely address that whether it's for the email going through your your uh, your email gateway whether it's a usb going into a device whether it's uh, uh, a file being received from the web uh, onto an endpoint the point being that whatever the entry mechanism is um run the the sandboxing that the forensic detonation process can ensure that you move that patient zero away from the actual operational system. So it's becoming ever more valuable. And as you can see at the top there, it's an example of where we're looking to break the kill chain with forensic detonation. And it helps automation, it helps you address the risks more quickly, drop your time to detect and drop your time to remediate. Go to the next slide, please. Um, I think we've talked about this, but again, just for 10 seconds, Automation is critical because we all know there's not enough people with not the right, with not enough skills and not enough time to address the plethora of risks they're seeing. So achieving automation, whether it's throughout the network, whether it's uh, through the email gateway or right down at the endpoint to ensure that patient zero doesn't happen in any of those points is absolutely critical. Next slide, please. So. Very briefly, this is the final sort of aspect, really. Deception, again, it's very much coming into the fray now. Gartner have started to recognize it as a, a viable way of achieving better contextual security intelligence. So if you take the forensic detonation we talked about before, and you saw where it, where it looked to break the kill chain at the exploitation and delivery phase, if you pivot to the left-hand side there, and we look at the reconnaissance, when the attacker is saying, what can I see? Oh, there's a, there's a database server there, there's a web server there. Uh, ah, okay, there's a Windows XP device there. I'm pretty certain I can attack that. Deception can address those risks. It can literally address the kill chain right at the reconnaissance phase. And therefore, it then comes down to a risk-based decision. And it addresses all types of risk, whether they're classic IT communication, OT communication, IOP, IoT-based devices. Um, all of those can be addressed uh, with deception by in a number of ways effectively and i'm conscious we don't really have time to go into the, the detail here but i simply wanted to introduce the fact that if you if you align multiple solutions in an integrated form you can actually break the kill chain at multiple places in an automated repeatable way with with minimal additional administrative effort required from the teams because the automation will handle it we'll go to the next slide please And I think really this is this is an example of organizations are constantly on a journey. It's as we all know, it's cyclical. Um, and wherever you are on that journey, I think that the, the, the combination of the Fortinet breadth of capabilities that we've got, um, you know, working with digital space to make sure that you're prioritizing in, in a way that fits your OPEX and CAPEX based requirements and expectations there's always an option and i think you know whether it's deception whether it's sandboxing whether it's endpoint behavioral capability whether it's global visibility whether it's the automation that wraps around all of it and everything in between all of that can be addressed and just to sort of finish off the deception piece i wanted just to show and it's a bit of an ugly slide but bear with me on the thought process here this is an example of what our deception sort of capability can bring to the party if you like and i wanted just to call out maybe three items here ip cameras printers and under uninterruptible power supplies you might think why would you want to create decoys that look like that that are fully functioning versions of that in your network the reason is simply because those three ice aspects have been attacked a huge amount in recent months we've seen hp release three vulnerabilities that would have allowed attackers to remotely gain control of printers and then use them as a staging point to get onto networks we've seen the same with a number of uninterruptible power supply manufacturers that again would have allowed an uninterruptible power supply, not just to turn off the power to whatever's connected to it, but to use that to then connect the network to get to other areas. And of course, IP cameras uh, have been in the, the news for years based upon the Mirai botnet of a number of years ago where hundreds of thousands of IP connected cameras were subverted by an attack group. That's still very, very much in play and still alive. Um, and so I won't go through any of the others, but I think you know it's just an example of the breadth of of sort of art of the possible that is possible with the likes of deception as part of your strategy so we can go to the next slide please
So just finishing off then really, you know, what options are there? You know, we, we've looked at maybe what's important from a retail perspective or what could be important from a retail perspective. Um, context is critical. Having the right security intelligence at the right time in the right place is absolutely critical. That can be fed with the likes of sandboxing. It can be fed with deception. The automation can wrap around that and everything else that can give greater visibility so you can make better decisions and you can drive your time to detect and time to remediate down. It can also help with collaboration and collaboration is critically important across teams. So picking solutions that enable people to talk and work together better is important. Um, hunting and investigation, enabling that more easily by automating the regular stuff to allow people to do more of the interesting investigation to ultimately then tune your internal processes and procedures to help protect your business is absolutely crucial, but also very possible. Protecting at the behavioral level, complementing the likes of endpoint protection with detection and response so that you've got full spectrum capability to understand if something's happening and then have the automated ability to roll it back. And then training, information security awareness. And I'll leave you with this thought really. Those of you that have maybe haven't looked at it already, there is a lot of free training for information security awareness on training.fortinet.com. I've done it. I've got my friends and family to do it. They're still talking to me, which is generally a good sign. And I thoroughly recommend it. It's actually quite interesting and it's great for, you know, if you've got children, getting them to do some of it as well. to so sort of help ultimately breed a, a sort of a more positive approach to sort of cyber hygiene as we move forward. So that's me. I'd like to hand over to yourself, Paul. I hope I haven't taken too long. No, thank you very much, Chris. Great, great presentation. It really sets up nicely what uh, I wanted to articulate, which is everything Chris has said so far today would have been difficult enough if we were staying in the old world of the fixed networks, so where we had MPLS, people sat inside buildings, you used your security card to get into the building, your data centre was surrounded as ours are with huge fences and security guards. But of course, that's the, the, the massive change is that everything that Chris has articulated there has been turned on its head with a number of things, uh, cloud primarily, the, uh, COVID absolutely accelerated this with the working from home and, and portability of working, bring your own device to work, and then two more things that are really driving that and, and together is what has, uh, has really driven the fastest growing part of our portfolio, which is working with Fortinet and delivering SD-WAN end to end to our customers, is the physical network itself is changing. And there's, I'd like to say there's some switch offs and there's some switch ons happening. So the switch on is 5G. And um, if anybody checks me out on LinkedIn, you'll see that I spent the last 10 years at Nokia, of which the last four years up until 2020 was actually part of the 5G team actually designing and then taking 5G to, to market. And, and what gets me so excited about 5G is nothing to do with speed. Speed's there, but actually that's like 10 or 20 percent of the value of 5G. 5G is really about not being a technology, but it's a business model. It allows things to be done that could never be done before because it physically was impossible and the business model didn't work for the telcos. So I won't go through some too much detail. I'd like Chris said, you know, it might look like a scary slide, but actually I just wanted to point out just how much is there within 5G. New spectrum, you can see there, look, today we've only got that, what, 25% of the spectrum that we're now gonna have. What does that mean? Huge amounts of new things. So the new air interface, and particularly massive MIMO. I'll give you a great example, a 4G mast, one of those large ones that you'll see up on the top of the, 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 the crown of thorns, as we used to call it in the trade. You know, that might be able to handle 25 to 30,000 mobile dev devices pinging it, and maybe 5,000 of those devices talking, and of course in latter day, rather than voice traffic, uh, IP and data traffic. Uh, Immediately, that's turned on its head now as we move towards 5G, a master will be able to handle 2.5 million devices. So all of a sudden, we're enabling what we, we, we expect to see, the really Internet of Things. The thing that stopped the Internet of Things really taking off so far is that if you've got an Internet of Thing, big or small, and it's wired up to a network, it's not really going to go anywhere. So it's not really a thing that can be dynamic in the environment. So, of course, cellular and access to those Internet of Things will be completely enhanced. Also, the low power bands that allows very small devices to use the network without needing much battery power. We're talking about you know, dynamic devices that can be online for two years without having its battery changed in the IoT world. So you've got this MIMO, which is this massive lots of input and output. 
flexibility so you can have small and large frames or data flows all happening at the same time. You've got all these new uh, interfaces, which I'll come along to in a minute, particularly millimeter. You've got this multiple connectivity where you'll be able to have open SIMs. So rather than a Vodafone or an EE SIM, you can have a SIM that will actually, I'm offering this now actually as part of our latest Fortinet SD-WAN solutions. So it'll pick the best network that's fit for purpose for what's needed. So if you just want some big, fast throughput, it'll be the throughput that could be, for example, EE. Uh, if you're looking for just some pinging and some background backing up, it could be that O2 is offering a great uh, package at the moment where you can unlimited data. So you would use that one. And, and that dynamics is then embedded within both the, the SD-WAN architecture, but also all of the security that you've seen from Chris earlier on. And then finally, the architecture, this is the bit I'm most uh, proud of, is that we realized to do all this, we had to throw the rule book away on 3 and 4G. So 5G is completely rewritten to be 100% cloud-based. It's all microservices that allows it to be run on the back of a laptop or in the middle of a data center. And that is something that you'll start to see come through as we see some of the solutions developing. Now, one of the things I always say to people is you haven't got to wait. And it's not going to be a big bang Friday morning, 5G will be here. LTE, that you'll know 4G is actually LTE. That's that's um, long-term evolution is what it stands for, is exactly that, is it will migrate from where we are now through into 5G seamlessly. And again, the beauty about working with Fortinet and our SD-WAN managed services is that it doesn't matter the network doesn't care what the access is. It could be fixed, it could be mobile, it could be cellular, it could be mixed cellular, it could be 4 and 5G, it can be fiber, it can be copper, and you can change it dynamically as you go through the life cycle of that solution as you deliver it to your, your customers and to your and to your users. So today we're moving into 4 and a half G. I was down in Croyd recently with my family and I took my little my remote uh, access device. I got myself a Vodafone SIM because I knew that there was a big implementation of quite sad like that. I knew that they'd uh, Vodafone done a big implementation in North Devon. And I was sat in the campsite with my, my boys uh, watching Netflix on the laptop and we were getting 140 megabit uh, coming down through. So that was actually 4G to 4.5G. In fact, over the week and a half, the guys were gaming, watching Netflix, watching AW, uh, Amazon. Uh, and more importantly, we had that access real time from a mast for a fixed fee of whatever it was, 40 or 50 pounds for the month. So it's here today where you can see as 5G starts to evolve, then we're going to be moving into, you know, exactly the same speeds as the fastest broadband available. So there really won't be a difference. Um, I also like to use what I call my uh, my 5G opportunity triangle because it is really about the, the speed is there and it's important, but it's those other really important parts of what 5G offers that you'll see as the retail hospitality trade in where you'll be able to drive the dynamics of, for example, everything having a SIM and chip, trackability, and also the ability to access data at, at sub one millisecond. Uh, why is that important? That's the same speed as the human brain when it's working. So this is where you'll see autonomous cars, autonomous vehicles coming into being, because that's the same speed as humans work, and therefore you will get augmented reality and real-time augmentation within the network. So we've got the enhanced mobile, as it's called, that's the super fast, very quick with low latency. You've got the massive machine that I mentioned, in other words, millions of things accessing the network, not tens of thousands of things. Also, your SIM card will be gone forever. I'm sure you'll be pleased to know. You'll have eSIMs, so they'll just be built into the device, particularly for IoT. The SIM will be built into the device. It'll be multitasking, and it'll also be multi-network based on the fact that we can choose those networks. And then finally, of course, we'll have this ultra low latency, which is the one I'm most excited about. You know, Tesla, for example, are making huge investments in 5G. All their cars come 5G enabled today. Uh, it's one of the reasons Verizon is so fast, uh, far ahead at the moment with what they're doing, because in fact, they're doing that uh, on the West Coast of US for Tesla to allow Tesla to enable all of their solution sets. Now, I talked about 5G as the switch on or the switch over, which I'm very excited about. Of course, I, I come from that world. But actually, something else which is huge, very exciting, but also does need a little bit of, uh, of comprehension is this whole switch off. And uh, I know a lot of people, particularly my local village here, often said, oh, Paul, it's, you know, is it just, you know, here's a BT really going to switch the telephone network off? Well, they've got no choice. They've got to. It's actually been out of spare parts since about 2018. 
Ofcom gave them a special allowance to get us to where we are today. But quite simply, there is no more parts left. There's parts not being uh, made, and, and even the parts that were spare and the decommissioned parts are running out. So quite simply, BT has no choice. Also, it's the future. The future really is to move to all IP, fibre where you can, and then we'll see fibre to the cab and fibre to the pole, which is another uh, technology off the back of uh, fibre to the premise that will allow everyone everywhere in the UK to have access to that network. And remember, if you connect that with 5G, where over the air, you'll be getting exactly the same speeds. That is how we're going to be able to guarantee coverage across the UK. And again, if you look at Germany, which is a few years in front of us, they've covered their last five or six percent of their coverage with 5G, what's called fixed wireless access, where you use 5G in a directional beam forming way to literally have a fibre in the sky between you and a node to give you that access. And we'll be seeing that coming to the UK too. The other thing is that the PSTN or wholesale line rental PSTN switch off is just the start of eight switch offs, as I mentioned earlier on when, when, when we started this webinar. And I think the one that's really important because it's going to affect all of us in such a big way is the fact as part of this switch off and as part of the digital transformation of the UK, BT will be moving from six and a half thousand exchanges to about a thousand. And of those thousand, there's going to be about a hundred exchanges that make up the super backbone node. But then those thousand exchanges will be what we call OAP, not to be confused with uh, the older generation. But in fact, uh, it'll be open reach access points where everything will then hang off. So if you are a resident at home or you are uh, in, a, in a village or in a town, you won't realise necessarily, but they're not running the fibre back to the local exchange. They're always going back to the super exchanges and the parent child exchange layout that we've had since the 1950s will disappear. Uh, that's not only going to make a huge saving, BT's second largest bill after their wage bill is their power bill. It's in the hundreds of millions, keeping all those exchanges running and all that PSDN running that runs your, your, your landlines. So it's going to be a huge saving, but it's also going to release over four and a half thousand properties that can be, of course, renovated and sold off for something else. And again, all this is how... Uh, the whole of the PSDN and the wider uh, switch off is being funded. So what does it mean for us and our customers? Well, I'm excited about this. I mean, you know, it's yes, it's going to be a bit of a pain. There's still a few bits and pieces we're working through. Lifts are proving to be an interesting challenge. Every lift by law has to have a phone in it in case, of course, it breaks down. And of course, it's a PSDN line that has a dull tone so you can bring 999 and get yourself to safety. There's also all of the alarms and some of the old faxes and telexes out there that would you believe are still there. And there are some really cool solutions. We're, we're working on a number at the moment in digital space. And the most important thing is it's going to enable this four point plan that I see for us all as users, as customers, and also as digital space, as a provider of these services. Much better increased productivity, an even easier hybrid working model. Uh, we're seeing it already. COVID just accelerated it beyond anything we would have seen coming through in the last two years. And then on top of that, we're seeing with the switch off and with the move to new technology, the ability to go to this next level of IoT, all of which, of course, needs all of that security. So everything that Chris was uh, talking about earlier on becomes even more complex when you don't own, own that network anymore. You know, we're not selling MPLS networks with fixed firework, fire, fireworks, firewalls. We're selling SD-WAN solutions with cloud-enabled, multi and hybrid cloud, all of which needs to be secured. And that's the transformation that we're seeing in cloud enablement. And finally, of course, the working practices that we see across the business. Now, it's not going to be a one size fits all. And it's an engineering task, which is why I get so excited about it. It's a proper big engineering task. But I can really break it down, all of these switch offs into sort of two main areas. This also reflects actually uh, the wider base of customers as they look to cloud and on-prem themselves. But here I'm talking particularly about UC and switch voice. So for our customers who would like to continue to sweat those assets a bit more, then there are some really creative ways of getting all of the, because the ISDN 2s, the ISDN 30s, they'll all be switched off as well through this. There'll be none of those left. Uh, there'll be nothing really to run a PABX on other than SIP chunking. But we can, on the left-hand side, run through with our customers, how we can strategically move, sweat the assets to a certain point and allow that migration off. Now, to be fair, 
actually, you can imagine most of these PBX are coming end of life themselves. Many are going out of uh, production and many are going end of life. So actually at some point in time, very similar to where BT is now with its own infrastructure, we'll get to a point where there isn't any parts and spares and we can't actually maintain the switches, but there is a very easy and, and safe migration path to get uh, our customers where they need to go. And then there's those customers that will move straight to UC on the cloud and more importantly to all IP. And in fact, I've got one customer now uh, that runs a very large um, cinema chain all around the world. And here in the UK, they've actually literally in the last, I think, six weeks become fully PSDN switch off ready. So they moved everything to Ethernet, fiber to the premise where they could. And I think most of their, because they were in big conurbations, they were able to get fiber to the prem. So they've got fast Ethernet access through their whole network and they they converted all of their voice, their inbound for booking the, 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 the cinema tickets. Of course, we know that most of that's done online as well. So it's omni and multi-channel. Everything's gone UC over IP and they're ready now and they don't have any, okay, they had 28 sites. You know, that's a relatively easy. We have customers with thousands of sites that we're now talking to them about that migration. Um, but the thing is that we're going to make it easier. We're going to make it flexible. And most importantly, we're going to make it a business benefit to the customers. So hopefully I've kept time. Um, I'll just check in. Yes, I think I've done just about right now. Um, all of the slides you've seen today are going to be uh, available uh, with the, uh, the, the link at the end of this uh, webinar. Um, and also uh, myself and Chris would be very pleased, uh, along with our teams, to offer any form of consultancy or follow on uh, for those of you that are thinking, wow, that's okay, that's interesting, but not sure how it really fits into my business, or I'm halfway there, or I thought about some of that, but I hadn't thought about the rest. Uh, you know, that's very much what we're hoping to do today is to is to meet you as, as new or existing customers and to look to talk to you about how we can help in the future.